can you become that if there's not an existing knowledge of what God expects from mankind? Exactly. So we can't just go back and say, okay, we got 2,448 years flying by here, and man's just left on their own. I mean, that seemed asinine to us. Yeah. Right? Like God didn't know what he was doing. Well, if he didn't know what he was doing, at least he, he's out, we're out of control. Right. right? And there is no stipulation, at least from God, with the exception of you can eat this and don't eat that. Mm-hmm. Of course, after the flood, you know, we, we come to that after the flood, and we're told that if a man sheds the blood of man, then that man's blood is to be shed by man. Right. Uh, which is a prohibition against murder. It deals uh, with two there. Doesn't yeah, it? exactly. What's the other one? It's setting up course of justice. Well, you because have to have a court. It's that's actually the more only than that. way right. you, can, you can punish a man for shedding the blood of another man. Exactly. It says that your blood, if you shed the blood of man, your blood is to be shed by men. Right. So you have to have a court of justice in order to be able to do that. You just can't arbitrarily go out and take the life right. of somebody because, you know, they took somebody's life. Because then you would be doing the same thing. You would be uh, perpetrating murder just as he exactly. did. And then, of course, we have a further prohibition. And that further prohibition that Noah gets is don't eat the limb of a living animal. So just in that context, we're talking about three more laws uh, immediately after the flood. Yeah. And these are not new laws. Right. Really. They're being kind of like just re-brought up. Exactly. And, and, and again, it's the fact that you have this, you know, it, some people say that there was this covenant, this, uh, they call it a, a Adamic covenant. Uh, I don't necessarily too much agree with that. And, and it's, a, it's a rehearsal in some way of the laws of the Adamic covenant. Well, if they're a rehearsal of the laws of the Adamic covenant, then those laws must have pre-existed. Exactly. In some form. Exactly. Okay. What we don't have, at least, is a, a, we can't go to a chapter and verse and say, okay, here are the seven laws known. You know, prohibition against murder, prohibition against blasphemy, prohibition against murder, prohibition against theft, prohibition against illicit sex, uh, prohibition against eating the limb of a living animal. And finally, it's really a prohibition against injustice, which really turns around into a positive one to establish courts of justice. Right. So, what are, what are these guys doing for 2,448 years? Just kind of uh, hacking it on their own? Good question, right? Right. Well, go, right before the flood, you know, we see man getting judged. Exactly. You know, because, you know, God declares that, you know, they're corrupt whole world is corrupt, yes. you know? Uh, and filled with violence, by the way. Filled with violence. Uh, and, and so, what, again, you know, what is it that makes God look at man at that time period in time and decide that they've broken something that he views as going against his will? They had to have known. Good There's no way that you know, the, the just judge of the world would judge unjustly. Exactly. And that's Abraham's position. So. <laughs> with with Psalm Gomorrah, you know, when Abraham, he says, I know Abraham that he would teach his children, right. his household, the ways of the Lord, right. and the ways of the Lord are justice and righteousness. Right. That's his ways. That's the way he behaves. Right. And then Abraham comes right along and he asks God, you know, well, he reveals to him, he's about the story of Psalm and Gomorrah, and he says, will the just judge of the whole earth, the universe, will he judge unjustly? Well, it's obvious that if we accept that God's ways, his behaviors are justice and righteous, it's obvious he's not going to judge that way. Right, right, correct. Right? So, we have that. I mean, these are things that we find within the text themselves that we can just kind of draw information from. Right. So, even though we got 2,448 years before we actually have a a written document that's referred to as the Torah, mm-hmm, right? mm-hmm. the way, the teaching, the path. I mean, it can be understood in many different ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, most people, by the way, that uh, maybe for the first time they've ever heard the word Torah, it's really just what we call, uh, from a English standpoint, the Pentateuch, you know, the, the first five books. Yeah. These five books, were, of course, were written by Moses. Uh, they were not just inspired books, by the way. Some right. people have that idea. 
these books were written word for word as God dictated to Moses what to write. In other words, we refer to this type of, of, uh, of writing as mechanical dictation. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like being in a courtroom, the best way I can explain it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you have a guy on the wall, wall machine, you know, and he's writing word for word what the judge says, what the lawyers say, what the witness say. It has to be exactly, precisely, exactly what they say, word for word. Right. You know, I remember, I think they also sometimes would use tapes and use dictaphones to go back and type mm -hmm. it up word for word. Now, that, that's a very good point. And, and I think that anyone who, who looks at the Bible and looks at what some call the Old Testament and looks at what others refer to you know, as Torah and, and Tanakh, uh, and they see in their religious background a validity to this text, if they want to accept the validity of this text, then they have to realize that it had to be given by divine inspiration in order for it to not be tainted by man. Uh, because man can make mistakes. Absolutely. So, you know, for, for anybody that's listening, we're talking about the fact that God has put instruction within the words that teach people and that m people who are seeking to know God should be looking into the words to define and to determine what is being said. But many people, as he said earlier, it's like it's so obvious that they miss it. <laughs> and that's what we're hoping to bring out. And, and that's one of my favorite quotes, by the way, is that, and, and, and I've always said too, uh, one of my favorite sayings is that familiarity breeds ignorance. So the more familiar that we become with some things, the more ignorant we become of it. Because we already think we know what it says. Yeah, yeah. Right? And, and another point, we keep throwing Hebrew words. Exactly. That's we'll actually what, what the issue is. Yes. Is that everything has gotten lost in translation. <laughs> exactly. You know, <laughs> that movie came out, and, and I remember reading the words of the title, Lost in Translation, and I thought, oh my gosh, that's perfect. It exactly. makes sense. Exactly. And that's the reality of it, is that everybody's used to reading translations for the last 20-something hundred years that they have failed to catch to the, you know, the nuances that are behind each Hebrew word that, that the text is written in. I mean, this is the language that it was given to Moses and the people of Israel in. And, and you got to realize, Moses was <laughs> recapping. <laughs> you know, what happened 2,400 years prior. Yeah, 2,448 years is covered in about 50 exactly. chapters. <laughs> you know, so if you don't think of what you're reading in this perspective, you're really missing out a lot. And yes, the King James, most popular version of, of the translations, has some, some good pretty, stuff. pretty good stuff in there. It's almost, almost... I would say at least 96, 97 percent correct. Uh, but regardless of that, you still have to get back to the Hebrew. And the only way you're going to do that is if you start seeking out those who can teach you what the actual words say. Once you learn that, then you can take it upon yourself to go back and reread everything with all the, you know, information that's available to you. And you got to realize, just like a family history, when you're handed down something through your bloodline, you know that what you've been told <laughs> is correct. And that's something that can never be taken away from anyone. And this was the idea of the Torah, not just the, you know, maybe people haven't heard of really the idea about oral Torah, but oral Torah and tradition was something that was passed down from generation to generation. Right. You know, when you come to passages in the Torah itself, like in the book of uh, Deuteronomy, the book of Devarim in Hebrew, these are things, these ideas, for example, the uh, you have the Shema, uh, which is here with Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, mm -hmm. and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and thou shalt teach these things diligently to your children. What things? The oneness of God, the absolute unity of God, uh, that you should love this God, that you should love him with all your heart, with you know, with all that's within you, that you should love him with uh, your soul, and, and then might means everything that you have, you know, all your wealth, material things that you have. Uh, 
But the but the real true idea is, at least from our perspective, is the unobvious thing for what most people I think is that they don't realize that 2,448 years have transpired 